Hello everyone, this is Dr. David. You can call me Margarita. Today we're going to review the autonomic nervous system, but we are going to focus on the sympathetic nervous system. I'll touch on the parasympathetic, but our focus will be the sympathetic. The number one thing that I want you to keep in your heads are these definitions. I want you to make sure that you understand what agonist means and what antagonist means. So agonist means that you're stimulating a normal response. So when we're talking about receptors, if we go into detail regarding the beta 2 receptors that are located in your lungs if I'm going to give a medication that's going to act as an agonist it's going to actually even open up the airways even more so normally the beta 2 receptors in your lungs you have two lungs keep those airways open if I give them an agonist medication it's going to maintain them open one of these medications is albuterol so if I were to give an active asthmatic patient who's airways are closed or constricted, then that's going to do the normal response of that receptor, which is to keep them open. The same goes if I were to give an antagonist medication to a patient that has an asthma attack. For example, if I were to give them a beta-2 non-specific or non-selective beta blocker, which means that it can act on any of the beta receptors. So if I were to give them a beta-2 non-selective beta blocker to a patient, that's gonna act as an antagonist, which is gonna block the normal response of keeping those airways open, but instead it's going to constrict them, which is why you have to be very careful when a patient is in active asthma or has any type of other lung diseases like pneumonia or COPD and emphysema, when giving them a beta-2 non-selective beta blocker because it can constrict those airways. So remember, agonist means you're gonna stimulate the normal response and antagonist means that you're gonna block the normal response. When we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, we're saying that this is a system that regulates your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your vascular constriction. And it does that through several ways. So one is gonna do that through the sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight or flight response. That's what's gonna control your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your heart contraction, which is going to all increase. So you use this every single day. You're using it when you're walking, when you're running, when you wake up, when you're outside jogging, walking your dog. That's something that is going to give you the energy to function throughout the day. So you're going to have an elevated heart rate, your blood pressure is going to be slightly higher, and the contraction ability is going to increase. The parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. So that's called the rest and digest. It counterbalances the sympathetic nervous system response. So instead of having an elevated heart rate or an elevated blood pressure or an increased heart contraction is going to do the opposite of that. So a perfect example and the reason why it's called rest and digest is when you're eating. After you eat, you're digesting. So you're supposed to be resting. So everything's slowed down. The autonomic nervous system acts as an on and off switch, okay? So there are several receptors that are part of this system. And those are the alpha receptors, which have alpha one and alpha two. You have your beta one and your beta two receptors. Your alpha receptors are located in your arteries. However, remember there's one and two. So your alpha one receptors are in charge of vasoconstriction. That is why the blood pressure rises. Your alpha-2 receptors are in charge of vasodilation, which is why your blood pressure decreases. So if I were to give a patient an alpha-1 receptor blocker or an alpha-1 receptor antagonist, instead of it vasoconstricting, it's gonna vasodilate. If I were to give someone an alpha-2 receptor blocker or an alpha-2 receptor antagonist instead of vasodilation is going to vasoconstrict. So it does the opposite. If I were to give them a alpha-1 receptor agonist, it's going to continue to either increase the blood pressure for one or decrease the blood pressure for two because it's going to act to stimulate the normal response of that receptor. When we're talking about the beta-1 receptors, those are located in your heart. So beta-1, one for one heart as well as the justoglomeral cells of your kidneys. These cells are in charge of the release of renin, which starts the raw system, which in turn will increase your blood pressure. So make sure you remember the beta-1 receptors are located in your heart, one for one heart. 
Then you have the beta-2 receptors. The beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs, two for two lungs. So that is for your bronchioles, as well as your eyes and the arteries of the skeletal muscle. So again, the alpha receptors are located in your arteries. The beta-1 receptors are located in your heart, as well as the just glomerular cells of your kidneys for the release of renin, which in turn increases your blood pressure. And the beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs two for two lungs, which is the bronchioles, the eyes, the arteries of the skeletal muscle. So for example, if I were to give someone a beta-1 receptor antagonist, it's going to do the opposite response. So a beta-1 receptor will keep your heart rate up and your blood pressure up. So if I were to give them a beta-1 antagonist, then I'm going to do the opposite effect. So I'm going to decrease that blood pressure and decrease the heart rate. If I were to give a beta-2 receptor blocker or antagonist, we talked about in the beginning where I'm going to do the opposite effect. So beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs. So instead of keeping those airways open, I'm going to block the normal response of keeping the airways open and I'm going to constrict them. That is the case with your beta blockers that are non-selective. So again, remember, alpha receptors are located in your arteries, beta-1 receptors are located in your heart and just the glomerular cells of your kidneys, and the beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs as well as your eyes and the arteries of skeletal muscles. Now what we're going to do is that we're going to go a little bit more in depth as to what are the exact things that you're going to see when each of the, these receptors are activated? Just a quick review before we move on to the specifics about each of the receptors. The agonist word that I told you to remember means that it's going to stimulate a normal response and antagonist means that it's going to block a normal response. The normal response of your alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors are the following. Once they are stimulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine, your alpha-1 receptors are going to cause the arteries to constrict as opposed to your alpha-2 receptors that are going to cause the arteries to dilate. So when it constricts for your alpha-1, your blood pressure will go up. When it dilates for alpha-2, your blood pressure will drop. Remember, it is not located in your skeletal muscle. It's located in all the other arteries except the skeletal muscle because it needs to stay open so it can utilize that extra oxygen uh, saturation that's happening due to the other receptors being stimulated as well as those nutrients that come with it. Your beta-1 receptors are located in your heart, remember one for one heart, and the stimulation of these receptors cause an elevation in your heart rate due to the increase in strength of your heart's contraction. Remember, when this receptor beta-1 is stimulated or agonist is going to cause an increase in heart rate due to the increase in the heart strength of contraction. So if your heart's contracting faster, stronger is going to give you a higher heart rate. Now when we're talking about the beta-2 receptors, the beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs. You have two lungs, beta-2 for two lungs. Once they're stimulated, the bronchioles, the diameter of the bronchioles are increased. So it dilates them so the person can breathe easier. It also dilates the vessels of the skeletal muscle in order for it to receive the increased blood flow that has been produced by the stimulation of your alpha and your beta-1 receptors. So remember, beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs, two for two lungs. Once stimulated, the diameter of those bronchioles will open, which is the case when the patient receives albuterol and also it dilates the vessels of the skeletal muscles, which are needed to be open in order to provide that extra blood flow that's rich in oxygen and nutrients. Due to the increase in the strength of contraction as a result of the stimulation of your beta-1 receptors and everything that your alpha receptors do once they're stimulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now we're gonna look at the specific things that you will see in your patient when any of these are stimulated. So now we're gonna go into the specific things that you're gonna see in your patient once the alpha-1 and 2 as well as the beta-1 and 2 receptors are stimulated. So remember that your alpha-1 receptors and alpha-2 receptors are located in your arteries with the exception of your skeletal muscle. 
the alpha-1 receptors, when they are stimulated, is going to increase the peripheral resistance, which causes vasoconstriction, which in turn increases your blood pressure. It also causes your pupils to dilate and an increased closure of the bladder sphincter. When the alpha-2 receptors are stimulated, it causes an inhibition of norepinephrine release, as well as acetylcholine release, and the inhibition of insulin release. What does this mean? So if you have a diabetic patient, a type 2 diabetic, who still produces some level of insulin, and you give them an alpha-2 receptor stimulator or agonist, it's going to inhibit that insulin from being released so their blood sugar may get elevated. So you want to make sure you're monitoring your diabetic patients. Then you have the beta-1 receptors and the beta-2 receptors. When the beta-1 receptors, remember one for one heart, when these are stimulated, you're gonna have an increase in the myocardial contractility, the heart's contraction, which is gonna cause an increase in the heart rate, as well as an increase in the release of renin, which is responsible for the increase in blood pressure, and as well as lipolysis. So you're gonna have more fat being metabolized or broken down. Then you have the beta-2 receptors. If the beta-2 receptors are stimulated, you're gonna have a decrease in peripheral resistance, which in turn, and I put here, does the BP go down or up? Well, because a decrease in peripheral resistance causes vasodilation, you're gonna have a decreased blood pressure. Bronchodilation, so remember your beta-2 receptors are located in your lungs, so those arteries in the bronchioles are going to dilate so it's going to allow the person to breathe easier and there's going to be an increase in muscle and liver glycogenolysis which means that there's going to be more sugar more glucose available to be used by the muscle so the sugar level in a patient although it's going to be used for muscle contraction may go up so similar to the inhibition of insulin release which you're going to have an increase in blood sugar because somebody that is dependent on the little insulin they have like a type 2 diabetic this is going to be inhibited so their blood sugar may go up this may also happen when you stimulate the beta 2 receptors although the muscles are going to use this sugar sometimes the sugar starts roaming around because the muscles can only take a certain percentage of glucose at a time so you might want to make sure that you're monitoring your diabetic patients so remember, in order for you to understand how beta blockers work or alpha uh, receptor blocks work, you have to make sure you understand what are the things that they actually do, the agonist part of it. Because when we give these type of medications, a lot of them like beta blockers are trying to work as an antagonist. They're trying to act as an antagonizing agent. So if we have a patient that's getting a beta one receptor blocker or a selective beta blocker that it's only going to target your beta 1 receptors instead of that heart being heart rate being elevated it's going to decrease instead of that contraction of the heart increasing it's going to decrease instead of the release of renin being increased it's going to decrease so when you're giving a blocking agent or an antagonizing agent it's going to do the reverse of the receptors action the same goes with an agonist. So if you are given an agonist agent, you're actually going to increase everything that it actually does. So you're stimulating its normal response. So make sure that is clear because in um, some other videos that I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be covering beta blockers as well as alpha receptor blockers. So it's very important that you understand what the words agonist and antagonist mean. Well, thank you so much for your time. If you like this video, make sure you press like, put any comments you have underneath in the comment section, share, subscribe. Um, I've been looking at all your comments, so I'm making a list of all those videos that you want me to do. Also check out the website. I always put quizzes that relate to the videos in the website. In addition, I also have a tab with NCLEX questions that I update every week. They take a lot of time to do, so make sure you go in there. There's a lot of those questions and make sure you're, that you are using your test taking strategies. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. Bye.